On the phone for Vista. Uh, Mike Magruder. Thanks, Mike. Okay, um, Avangrid. Anybody from Avangrid? Arizona? Christy Coco's here. Thank you, Christy. Uh, Bank, anybody here from Bank? Okay. Uh, BPA? Michelle Cathcart. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, California ISO? John Phipps. Thanks, John. Um, Sanase? Anybody on the phone from Sanase? Okay. I see Bank walking in, so I'm just going to say Bank is here. Okay. <laughs> uh, Shalan? Okay, Douglas? Grant County? Okay, uh, City of San Francisco? Hetch Hetchy? Idaho Power? Ben Brandt is on the call. Thanks, Ben. Los Angeles? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, IID? IID, sir. Thank you. Los Angeles, Water and Power? Okay, Los Alamos? Uh, MID? James McFalls here. Thanks, James. Uh, Montana, Alberta, Tie Line? Nature Enter? Okay. Um, Northwestern? Anybody from Northwestern? Okay, Nevada? Shazad and Keith, I'm here. Thanks, Shazad. Pacific Corps? Eric Brookhouse is here. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Pacific Gas and Electric. This is Tom French. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Portland General. Corey McAllister. Thank you. Uh, PNM, Public Service New Mexico. Okay. So, uh, let's see. Puget Sound. Shauna Tractor. Thank you. Salt River. Steve Cobb. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Um, doing this electronically. Uh, SEE. Tony Edison. Thanks, Tony. San Diego. Thanks, Ali. Um, Seattle, City Light. Pablo Krupa on the phone. Thank you. Silicon Valley. Okay. Smud. Mark Willis. Thanks, Mark. Um, almost there, almost there. <laughs> Snohomish. Okay. Uh, Tacoma. Transbay Cable. Okay. Tri-State. Anybody on from Tri-State? Okay. Uh, VEA. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one. Turlock. Casey Hashimoto. Thanks, Casey. Uh, VEA. Valley Electric. And then Western Sierra Nevada. Kirk Soymorger. Thanks, Kirk. Okay, is there anybody that, while I was going, got on the line that I didn't capture? Manuel Sanchez from PNM. Okay, thanks, Manuel. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we'll get started. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Okay, uh, this is, I'm Christine Osborne. I work in Stakeholder Affairs. I'm facilitating the meeting today. 
Uh, so this is the agenda. First we have um, Bill Pettengill. He's going to kick it off. He's the Director of Regional Integration here at the ISO. He's going to provide a briefing on the structure of the Oversight Committee, which is detailed in the Charter. Um, and then he's going to turn it back over to Nancy. She's going to, uh, we're going to be electing the Chair and Vice Chair of the Committee. And then we're going to ask the members to decide on the voting rules as well as the term limits for the Chair and Vice Chair. Uh, so we have the, those three decisional items today. And then uh, Tim Beach from the uh, director of R RC West here at the ISO. Um, he is going to provide um, an update on RC operations. Um, included in that is Hannah. And so we have Gina Wanzer. She's here. She's in the back of the room. Uh, she's a client representative uh, here at the ISO. Uh, so she'll talk about the Hannah services. And then we'll have uh, Tricia Johnstone who's Senior Advisor for ISO Operations Compliance and Integration. Um, she's going to be providing an update on where we are at with RC certification. Um, and then uh, we'll go over agenda items for upcoming oversight committee meetings, and then uh, we, we have some time at the end for public comment. We'll start with comments in the room. I'll bring a microphone uh, to the back of the room if you do have any comments, um, and then we'll turn to the phone lines. Um, so with that, Bill? Uh, just so you know, too, we do have the presentation out on our website. If you go to Stay Inform and select Reliability Coordinator from the drop-down, you'll see a, um, a link to the RC Oversight Committee webpage. Um, and so the presentation is out there, as well as uh, we are recording the session. We'll make the recording available on that page as well. So, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Christina. And good afternoon, everybody. What I was going to do today is just, uh, as Nancy pointed out, since we're starting off, this is the first oversight committee meeting. This is where we now finally have our group of customers that uh, have elected to take service from us here at the ISO RC West. And so what I was going to do is walk through real quickly just an over the structure of what the oversight committee is. Um, I'm taking most of this information directly from the charter, but in terms of just sort of starting off at the level playing field and going through some of the background of where we got to and where we're at going forward from here. Because this will be the long-term committee structure that we have in terms of um, how to run RC West and, and provide reliability services to uh, our customers in our footprint. So with that opening, um, what we know is that we've asked, and in almost every case, each of you, the entities that are taking service from us, have a fairly senior level representative. Um, we have signed agreements with BAs and TOPS in order to make sure we have a very clear uh, role and uh, connection with those customers that are taking various levels of service from us. The ISO's Vice President of Operations, Eric Schmidt, then, is also a member of the committee in terms of our um, oversight here. And, of course, the ISO now, as a balancing area, um, has a role and a voting role here on the committee as well. So where you've seen us talk about having 39 contracts executed, when we add the ISO, we now have a nice round number of 40 entities in the, in the committee, the oversight committee. Um, now, what we're going to do today, as, as Nancy mentioned, is to elect a chair and a vice chair because we really would like to make sure we're hearing clearly from you, our, our customers, um, on how we should be operating this RC. And so we're looking forward to that next step after I'm finished here because that will really set things up for us going forward. Um, I know this is difficult to read. Again, it's in the presentation, but what it does is clearly identify all of the 40 entities that are taking customer taking service from us at the California ISO RC West. Um, and so I'll skip that one and just move on through by saying, so really, what is the role of the Oversight Committee, and what is it that we're looking for this group to do for for um, for this function? And the key thing is, is to help us in terms of any operational issues to the extent that we are having to deal with an issue on the system. We want to have a dialogue. Some of that dialogue may need to be in a public, in a public session. Some of it may, more importantly, need to be in a non-public session. And so from time to time, we will want to designate meeting time in order to deal with confidential information. And the charter addresses the type of topics and things that we may need to do that for. But overall, and overarching, is really help provide guidance to the RC in regards to the policies and procedures that, that we're using. Make sure we're doing that in an effective manner. And to the extent that um, there is a need to add new tools, new staffing, or other things that might affect 
The budget in particular, we want to make sure we're having an open dialogue about what those are and make sure there's a broad agreement on to move forward on those things. And finally, we're looking to the oversight committee to help designate work groups that can help us deal with some of the more detailed topics that are going to be necessary. And to the extent we don't need a work group, then let's decommission those. And where we need new ones, let's commission those in order to make sure we've got a very flexible structure and we're addressing the appropriate issues. So um, one of the key things that is addressed in the charter is how we intend to engage with external parties. For those that are not directly taking service from us, RC West, we wanted to be able to acknowledge it's important for us to hear from external entities, in particular the policymakers, whether they're <clears throat> energy advisors or commissioners throughout the rest of the Western interconnection. And so at this point, I wanted to highlight the, this, this point here about receiving input through a regulatory liaison. The ISO received a letter recently from um, YRAB um, in designating who they would like to designate as a regulatory liaison, and that individual is Jordan White. And I understand Jordan was going to be on the phone today listening in. He couldn't attend. But Jordan is a commissioner from the Utah Public Utilities Commission. And so we look forward to working with Jordan in terms of engaging with uh, the interest in Western uh, policymakers. The other thing I wanted to <clears throat> mention on this slide is that while I talked about earlier about any impacts to the ISO budget, the reality of it is the RC West budget is driven through the ISO corporate budget process. And so any, any specific changes really are going to have to go through our stakeholder process there. And the reason for that is the establishment of this new service is built into our tariff. And that's why we went ahead and filed with FERC to get approval on those tariff uh, provisions, as well as having receiving their approval for the RC services agreement that certainly all of you have signed. And for anybody who's interested in those, those are now publicly available as they've been executed um, through FERC's electronic filing process. So budget and specific uh, impacts to the charges will go through the ISO's normal uh, business practice on budgetary items, okay? So again, continuing with the theme on how to engage and engage externally, we wanted to share with you the basic timelines that we've outlined in how we intend to run these meetings. Um, and it's important to recognize what the charter, the charter envisions is we would at least have quarterly meetings and additional meetings as necessary um, as we continue to operate as a reliability coordinator on an ongoing basis. What we've already figured out is because of the startup and the important for us to engage on a fairly frequent basis during this year, um, we've went ahead and scheduled month, monthly meetings. And I'll show you what that schedule looks like. Either we're alternating back and forth between meetings that are going to be face-to-face -face like we are today or webinars in the, in the off uh, months. But for each of those meetings, <clears throat> what we intend, intend to do is put out a public notice. And, of course, now we've posted what all those meetings are. But one of the things that we'll also do is ask that if there is any topics that the public wants to ask the committee to address or discuss, to submit those at least two weeks in advance, because we're intending to formally post our final agenda at least one week in advance of those meetings. And then, of course, we'll post the documents that are necessary for the meeting to the extent that they are um, decisional items or otherwise require approval. Um, we're going to make we're, those things will be out there in that one week ahead time frame. But things like this presentation or other materials we would use during the course of the meeting, those may, those will get posted at least two business in advance. So everybody will know what we expect to talk about in each new session. Now, during each session, we're going to obviously post these presentations and the materials that we're, that we're deciding on. But also after each session, we'll go ahead and post what the result of those decisions were. And we're recording these meetings, the public portion of these meetings, so anyone can come back after the fact and be able to um, listen to what we talked about and understand how we got to the decisions that we did. Okay? So I mentioned the meeting schedule. Um, we're here now at March 14th, and you can see that over the course of the year, we've got a meeting scheduled in each of these months. Um, we're looking forward to the fact that in the June time frame, it is a webinar, um, only because we're now literally only two weeks before we're going to hand the RC over to Tim Beach and, and start this thing up and become the RC of record um, by July 1 uh, for the California plus Mexico footprint. 
And then, of course, the same thing actually happens in that um, November time frame. We're very near the end of October. We have a webinar, just a status, really, um, but just prior to the expectation that we cut over everybody by November 1 uh, for the rest of the footprint. Okay? So those meetings are already scheduled, and uh, following that um, process that I just mentioned previously, we'll lay out the documents and the materials ahead of time for each of those meetings. Yes, Steve. Yeah, Steve Cobb, SRP. So, Phil, as far as the uh, timeline for creation of meeting materials, are we going to memorialize that in a procedure somewhere that uh, folks can use as a touchstone for their preparations? We, we certainly can, Steve. There's no reason why not. Um, one of the things we tried to do here was follow the typical timelines that we use at the ISO, so things like getting those meetings out and the two weeks in advance and the one week in advance, all of those are consistent with the normal stakeholder process we have here. But if there's some value in trying to somehow or another make this more clear for the oversight committee, we can certainly do that. I don't know about the rest of the oversight committee, but I think it's a good idea. So. Okay. All right. Good. We'll do that. Okay. So. In terms of where you go get this information, um, what we've got is some hyperlinks embedded in this presentation. Um, so everybody um, can come back to this and use these um, as appropriately. But one of the things, what I wanted to point out is on the top of this here, what you see is we've now established a specific web page for the RC Oversight Committee. And so by going to that web page, you'll be able to see each of those scheduled meetings and be able to get to the documentation. So like for today, this presentation is already posted and the agenda is posted. And then after the fact, what will happen is we'll go ahead and make available the, in, the decisions that we're making as well as the recording of the meeting. So, all, so it'll, it'll create a historical record as well in terms of what we've intended to do and what we did do during each session. Um, the charter, of course, is there, but also there is a more generic RC web page um, on the ISO uh, website. So you can start there in terms of anyone wanting to know what is this RC, what is it that we're standing up, and, and go for the more generic information is available there as well. Okay, and then finally, to the extent that there are any questions, any, any, anything related to what we're doing as an RC, we've now established the RC West at CAISO.com as a mailbox for anyone to be able to submit questions to RC West and we'll respond to those. Yeah. Yeah, so is, will this new website, uh, new web page be an open web page? Will it be a confidential yeah. web page? Cool. This, is on, this is on the public side. It is true we're, set, we're setting up what we're referring to as the RC portal, so the point where we have to have confidential materials. The appropriate um, entities will have access to the confidential materials through that RC portal. Okay. And that's one thing that's now should be under test for everyone in regards to the integration testing, certainly for um, the July start, but everybody now has the ability to access that portal. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions from the committee on this? Okay. Thank you. And I think, Nancy, I'll hand it back to you. Okay, so here we are. We're here. Uh, you need to elect a chair and vice chair. Um, we did not receive any nominations over email. Uh, we do have the chair and vice chair, which from the uh, RC um, steering committee, project steering committee, which is Ms. Michelle Cathcart from BPA and Steve Cobb from SRP. Um, let me go one more. So we're, we, we're looking, once I'll ask for additional nominations, but before I do, the proposed term is for this first year, 2019, um, a one year term, get us through 2019, and then once we get into 2020, the proposed term is two years. Uh, the election for the for the chair and vice chair will be on majority vote, uh, most votes uh, of this by the um, committee. Um, so I'm going to open it up. Oh, let me say one more thing. We will vote on these terms after I get to the voting rules. So those will be official terms that we will vote on. I just wanted to put it up there in case anybody was jumping up to uh, want to do this. Uh, so I'll, I'll open it up for uh, other nominations uh, for the chair and vice chair. 
Anybody want to even nominate somebody? <laughs> this is John from the ISOBA. I'd propose or nominate that Steve and Michelle maybe continue for the first year if they're open to that. Okay, anybody want to second that? <laughs> okay. No, okay, so so we have that. You guys were pretty quick, uh, quick on the seconds there. I just want to let you know. <laughs> Okay, so let's quickly uh, go through. I think we okay. still have to ask them if they're okay with it. Oh, yes, I do, I do. <laughs> okay, so let me ask uh, Steve and Michelle, are you both okay with the, the nomination and continuing your tremendous work one more year, the rest of the year? So, Michelle, I'll wait for you to answer first. <laughs> Yes. I accept. Thank you. Okay, let's go through, can we need to vote on this? So let, why don't we do it this way, based off everybody that's on the phone, is there anybody that is not in agree, um on the phone in the room, anybody not in agreement with uh, Michelle and Steve continuing this role in the Oversight Committee? Okay, hearing none, thank you very much. <laughs> Couldn't be working with a group, better group of people, so. Okay, so I wanted to go through the voting rules process. We came up with this process um, during uh, the steering committee meetings, but I wanted now that we're an oversight committee to go through this process um, again. And we're going to have to decide on this, so I'll go through it, um, and then uh, we'll make it a decisional item. Okay, so the voting rules, um, the, the RC West Oversight Committee, they're responsible for two things. One is overarching policies and procedures. Any overarching policy or procedure that, that the RC, the ISO, RC West will be um, using will come through the uh, Oversight Committee for approval. Um, and also any changes or revisions to the charter. Those are the two main objectives of, of the Oversight Committee. Um, Phil already mentioned this, all decisional items, anything that's a decisional item, we strive to get to you two weeks in advance so that you have time to uh, review it. Uh, in the past, what we've also done is kind of preempt, we've, we've kind of shown it up, uh, at the previous meeting to get everybody familiar and then we give you time to vote. Um, a quorum, what we're saying is a quorum here is 50% uh, of the RC uh, committee members that are present at the meeting, on the phone, uh, or have voted already by email in advance of, of the meeting. So that's how, what we've been using as a quorum for uh, and we want to continue to use for the oversight committee. Okay, uh, the approvals are based off simple majority of that quorum, um, and the chair will take a vote uh, by verbal roll call, very similar to what I just did uh, for the roll call. Um, so we take votes by the roll call, uh, and um, there's one vote per member. So everybody has a, a primary and an alternate, and it's one vote by member. And again, if you can't make the meeting or you can't be on the phone, but you want to vote in advance, we'll take that vote by member by email. Um, and then dissenting uh, positions will be captured. Um, and what we've done in the past is ask for the, that position to be drafted, and we also post the, that dissenting position. Um, and then we'll post all the decisions on the website within two business days of, of the meeting. So those are the voting rules. Um, do we want to vote on these currently? Steve or Michelle, I'll leave it to you. I think we should probably go on the record for voting on these particular or rules. If there's any discussion on them as well, maybe there's. So we'll go, is there a motion to accept these rules and then we'll have discussion thereafter? I move. Okay, Jim Shetler moves. Second? I'll second. 
Very good. Got a second. Any discussion? Okay, hearing no discussion, is anyone opposed to the adoption of these rules or do you guys want to do a roll call? No roll call is necessary. Okay, hearing no desire to have a roll call, is anyone opposed to adoption of these rules? Hearing no opposition, we'll consider them adopted, Nancy. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay, the next thing we need to do is, is decide on the term limits that I had already proposed for the chair and vice chair. So the limits um, for the first year, this year 2019, is a one year term starting now, and then 2020 and beyond will be a two year term. So again, um, Steve. Okay, is there a motion to accept these term limits? Well, this is Jonathan Nye, so I would maybe want to ask, would it make sense to have the uh, terms in 2020 be staggered for the chair and the vice chair, instead of having two new, uh, each be new each year, but actually have those be staggered? That's a good point. Any additional discussion? Are they actually term limits or just the duration? I, I'm sorry, I used the term limit, so. Uh, because you're just hoping that you're limited to one year. I, I, was, I was thinking about my own limitations. We, we will fix that. <laughs> okay, so we want to take that up. One other, sorry, go ahead. Uh, we said for a year from now, so are we saying from March to March, or do we mean the uh, through the 2019 calendar year? I think uh, part of the original discussion that took place on this is it would be March to March to move it away from the holidays. Perfect. Thank you. Hey, Steve, it's Keith. A quick question? Sure. Uh, no term limit, correct? That's correct, and, Keith. Okay, good. And then, um, and so in regards to uh, staggering them, um, I know in the industry it's been pretty typical for the vice to to move into the chair, and so you have an experienced individual uh, with no lapse in knowledge moving from the vice to the chair. Is that something that will prevail here, or, 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 or I guess the other option is is to stagger them, and that um, that also provides continuity. That's that's correct, Keith. I mean, we we've obviously done that at WEC and other. Um, industry organizations for a long period of time. So let's think about how this initial term would be since uh, I don't know that I'm going to go much more than a year. <laughs> so um, one of the things that we could do is um, in 2020, we could have the uh, vice chair have a one-year term and the chair have a two-year term, and then thereafter it would be two and to, well, that's not right. Somebody help me with this. How we get this thing going? No, I think I think you're right, Steve. If the chair has a two year in 2020, and then a one year, and okay. The following. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this initial term would be uh, two years for the vice chair, or two years for the chair, and one year for the vice chair. If Michelle's open to that, I think that would work. Yeah, two years for. Well, I was I was thinking it would start in 2020, but okay. Michelle, any what what are you thinking about this? Yeah, I think if it started in 2020, I think that's a good idea. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'll say the chair have a two-year term starting in 2020, the vice chair a one-year, and then in 2021 would elect a vice chair for a two-year term. Right. Okay, so let me make sure I got this. The chair, starting 2020, when we elect a new chair and vice chair, the chair will be a two-year term, um, and the vice chair would be a one-year term. And then we'll go, then we'll all roll two-year. Correct, and then in 2021, the vice chair would be up for a new uh, okay. nomination, which would then start a two-year okay. term. Okay, so let me go back up. 2020 chair will be a two-year term, vice chair a one-year term. 2021, the chair remains, and the vice chair, chair would be a two-year term. Right. Okay. Any other discussion? 
Motion to approve this. Uh, approval. Okay. Jim Scheller. Well, you're really fast on the draw today. <laughs> okay, Jim Scheller motions uh, to approve. Second. I'll second. Christy, Christy Coco. Coco for the second. Any other discussion? Anyone opposed to adopting this scheme for electing chair and vice chair? Hearing no opposition, we'll say that passes. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so now I want to introduce uh, Tim Beach. Tim is our Director of RC Services. He is going to go over um, an update which kind of takes us through at the high level the last year of, of effort to get, to get to this oversight committee and to get to where we are today. Tim? Thank you, Nancy. So again, uh, I'm Tim Beach, and we're going to go over the where we are today. We've had quite a bit of work um, uh, over the past year. We've been working very hard, and we've had a lot of stakeholder as well as uh, Jason RC uh, uh, coordination during that work. So the first slide here is we have our RC footprint. So that's been defined. We have uh, we have a FERC approved RC rate, which is established via our tariff. Uh, we have an RC agreement that's established. There's a 12 month exit entry uh, period, and we've executed 39 of 39 contracts for RC services. And uh, earlier, Phil talked about 40. Uh, so actually, if you look at it in a whole, if you had California ISO BA into the service, we're providing services to 40 entities in the, uh, in the Western United States. All of our RC, our, all of our RC core services. Uh, Can you go back to the map for just a second? Sure. Um, you're showing uh, grid force in the FPP RC, is that correct? Yeah. Grid force, yes, that's correct. Grid force is, uh, so it is, is short as FPP, but they have also uh, filed to become an RC themselves. Okay, thanks. And we'll, we'll touch on that later. So thank you, Jim. Uh, all of our IC core services will meet the uh, NERC standards, and we have them all listed here. Uh, we have some existing services that are currently by our PPOs, and we have our future RC customers. We'll be meeting those as well. And then we have some new services areas as, as well. So we have centralized messaging, uh, secure uh, um, centralized site for operating plans, stakeholder working groups, RC-wide restoration plan review. So we'll be approving all the restoration plans, reviewing and coordinating and training on those. We've actually started on some of that already. Uh, we have uh, a real-time analysis. Uh, situational awareness and uh, OPA or operation, operations plan analysis and outage coordination. So we're providing all those uh, services as we're required by the standards. Question? Um, on the outage coordination, um, because we're doing already outage coordination with the energy imbalance market, so this will be a completely separate outage coordination process or you'll be able to share some outage coordination across Yes, yeah, so it'll be a separate outage coordination process. Yeah, I am. Thanks. Um, but we're also doing some enhanced things. So we're going a little bit farther than the standards, right? Uh, we have a forward view, uh, a forward system view, day ahead and intraday process. Uh, we're doing a full 24 hour system analysis of the system. So we look at every outage, the load forecast, uh, the interchange across all those hours when we develop our operational planning analysis and determine our operational plan for the next day. So that, that's something that's, that, that's new to the West. Um, we're also developing or have developed a look ahead RTCA. So RTCA now, as many of us are familiar with, is sort of in the real time event. We're actually developed a, a system, RTCA, where we're looking in advance. We can predict where RTCA is gonna show in the next, next 15 minutes. So we have a little bit of advance notice on that. Uh, Staffing. So we've had uh, we have a new RC staff here at California ISO. We've had quite a process to go through it. We're fully staffed. We have uh, 18 RCs that we've hired. Um, our goal for the demographic of those RCs is to have some from peak with existing RC services or experience. We have some internal from California ISO, which is a, a lead transmission and generation dispatchers. We have some externals. So we've pulled people from ISO. 
people that have PGM experience, ERCOT experience. We have people that have training experience. We have people that have audit experience now. We have also have uh, lead transmission from transmission providers as well. So we have a very, very comprehensive uh, team of skills, and they really do have a lot of decision-making behind them. They've seen the events, and they've been through prevented events and that type of thing. So it's a pretty strong group. Our, our interview process was pretty long. We've done over 70 interviews. We had a two-step process. Uh, we really emphasized the fundamentals, power theory, standards, uh, behaviors, and then also their, their ability to soft skills as well. As leaders of the interconnection, that's what we like to think of as RC, as they're sort of a leader of the interconnection. We want to make sure they had those leadership skills involved. Uh, again, we have 18 on staff. We have six from, from Peak, six from ISO, and six fraternal. We have 345 years of operating experience among us, amongst that staff. That's a significant number. And additionally, we have hired 10 additional operation engineers to support our real-time activities. Uh, so we have our staff. Uh, now, where we're going to put them. So we have two control centers here at California ISO. We have one at Folsom and one in Lincoln. Both those will be staffed 24 by 7 with RCs. And here's a picture of our newly constructed. Go ahead. Um, Shazad Latif with MD Energy. Uh, the control centers, are they shared with all the other Cal ISO balancing authority and other staff? So uh, the, Cal the Folsom control center is not shared. It's a separate room adjacent to the, to the uh, BA control room. And uh, there's a picture of that right here. So it's standing in the BA control room. There's a glass wall, and then the RCs are in that room. That's a newly expanded room. In Lincoln, we are, we're sharing the uh, control room. Thank you. Um, so this is our new control room. Uh, we're just completing it now. Uh, we have a new video wall. We actually, that was a previous, it was a market control center. We've expanded it. We doubled it in size. We doubled the video wall. We put full-size consoles in there, and we added consoles as well. So it's a separate space space, but it's adjacent to the uh, VA. Uh, some of the tools that we provide uh, situational awareness. So we modified our EMS alarming and situational awareness tools. Uh, we created 80 new displays and overviews, and we've made changes to 200 existing displays, sort of to clean them up and give an RC perspective to those displays. And that's for California only. When we go to the expanded footprint, we'll be expanding that work quite a bit. Uh, we developed a vendor and, uh, and web-based messaging tool called Good Messaging System. This will replace RMT for California uh, ISO and the RC West uh, customers. It interfaces with the adjacent uh, RC tools. So it interfaces with SPP's RCOM messaging system as well. So we can broadcast messages from California to the SPP customers, as well as our BAs and TOPs, if they so choose, they could broadcast a message to another BA, TOP, uh, that's adjacent to them under a different RC. So we have a lot of work out. We've also developed guidelines for doing that in the circumstances where that would occur. Any BA or RC can generate a WEC-wide message if it is a large event immediately. So we've, we've sort of bridged the gap between having a single messaging system to multi-party but having the same functionality going forward. Uh, we've made enhancements to existing tools, so RTCA, we've done enhancements to that to accomplish the RTCA or the RC uh, uh, view of that. We've uh, uh, enhanced our OMS system, our outage management system. Uh, we've worked on the ECC, the in, in, uh, enhanced uh, curtailment calculator to accomplish our RC uh, stakeholder uh, uh, duties there. And uh, we've also integrated with our fully integrated tracking tool which is a way that we can look at the load forecast for all the BAs and TOPs within um, our RC footprint, among other things. Uh, so we've got the staff, we've got a place to put them, uh, we've got their tools, and now we're into the training method right now. So we've done a lot of internal training. We developed our standard operating procedures. Our first round of training has occurred on that already. Uh, we've trained on our IR oil operating guides that are, are to uh, take effect July 1st. That's been done. We're working on development for those for the expanded footprint as well. Uh, we've done simulation exercises all the way up from USA, USF, uh, and phase shifter coordination as well. We've done that with PEAK, so we've done some joint simulations. Uh, we've done tool training. We've had soft skill training on leadership, conflict resolution, and communications with our RCs. So we're trying to enhance the, the, the skills they already brought to us 
and keep them fresh as going forward. Uh, we've uh, trained on restoration, and we've completed all our TAF sign-offs with our first round of RCs um, this week, in fact. Yes. Um, the trainers, you did not cover the staffing, so trainers are shared uh, with the balancing authority, or did you have a separate staff of trainers for RC? The, well, for this first round, the RCs have developed a lot of the training themselves, and they've been delivering it. Going forward, the BA training staff, we have an operational readiness training group. They will be uh, also taking over some of that responsibility for RC services. But the RCs will always participate in the training because they're really the subject matter experts. Typically, they identify the training needs and uh, and develop the training. And then the training staff here at uh, so they help with the ADI process and the documentation and getting the CHs and reserving the rooms, a lot of logistics type things that we do. So now we have an external training effort. So we uh, we have joint training. We've hosted BA and TOP trainers here to come and train our staff and OEs. We'll continue that through the next year. Uh, we attended the Desert Southwest training seminars. So we sent RCs to that. We've also visited all the BAs and TOPs over this last winter. A lot of you have seen them in your control room, and we actually had them on the come and visit the control room, talk to the operators, start building a bit of a rapport with uh, the staff. And that went very well, too. A lot of positive comments on that. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. We said we're not going to uh, submit NERC form attack to to what? In our, I'm, I'm not sure I, I understand the question. I'm sorry, is, is the person asking the question, uh, asking of Tim, something about NERC form submitting to WEC? I'm thinking it might have been a, an off-site conversation. Sorry. Okay. We'll move on. Uh, and then uh, we've also done peak restoration training. So peak holding restoration activities uh, these last few weeks. The sixth week they're opening it up to all the RCs, and we're going to attend that and, and learn from them what they've learned from their training and restoration exercises. Shadow operations. So May 1st we start shadow operations. Uh, so we've established a ready, readiness criteria, and these are some of the things that the RCs will be doing when they're on shift during shadow operations, they're going to be verifying data. They'll be verifying BA monitoring, working with peak to make sure we agree and see the same type of things. They'll be looking at SOLs and IRLs and, and taking part in any discussions they have for mitigation of those with peak. Unscheduled flow monitoring, uh, outage coordination, the messaging tool, and EMS alarms. So we have a, a long list of stuff that they're going to be watching and checking off, making sure that we uh, can operate to. So establishing the readiness, uh, we talked about, uh, a lot of you are familiar with this, we've had a, a large transparent effort to write our procedures to break down the, the tasks that we need to do. And this uh, diagram illustrates the different working groups we've had. We've had, you know, Eric is the VP of operations and the reliability coordination staff reports to Eric. Uh, we have an RC steering committee, which is present here today. And off those, we, we uh, um, formed several groups to work on things. And just as an example, I'll, bring out the real-time working group group I led or my staff worked on. We worked with all the different procedures to develop those procedures. We worked on the messaging tool. We worked on normal and emergency operations. How do we coordinate those type of things? As a result of this effort, we, we came up with 35 standard operating procedures we developed. We looked at peaks procedures, and the, but we also went out and looked at PGM, MISO, ERCOT, other RCs in the, in the eastern Eastern interconnection to see if there's any best practices we can link for those, and we did get a few of those. We've developed 12 operating guides. That, uh, that'll that continue. So we've, we've started that. That's for California only ISO footprint. A lot of it continue to grow for the expanded footprint. And a lot of your people participate in those creation of those operating guides. The operating guides are for specific facilities with specific impacted parties. Uh, we've developed a methodology and a seasonal assessment process, a day ahead uh, operations plan analysis. We talked about that a little bit. Uh, operations planning coordination process. We have a data spec and guideline. Um, we have a, a, we've created our California ISO peak coordination agreement that's signed and agreed to. We'll be working on the other agreements with the other RCs in the, in the West uh, going forward this next year. We developed readiness criteria. 
We have restoration plan principles and review process that's been established. We reviewed all the restoration uh, plans for California. We'll be doing that for the extended footprint this uh, fall. And we have a training program as well. Tim, question for you on the sure. procedures. So obviously you guys, uh, we, as a group, we've spent a lot of time developing those procedures and I'm, I'm sure your team has spent a lot of time training on those procedures. So have you looked at the procedures from the perspective of the elements of those procedures that you would want the RC customers to be aware of that they should be training on, that you have any recommendations from that? Yes, we've talked about that with the RTWG, with our members there, and making them recognize that there are some changes here for you that you need to review your procedures if you use them to make sure they're consistent with ours. And, and for the most part, we haven't received anything back that they're not. Uh, you know, they, they can adopt as many elements as they want from those procedures or use them themselves as their reference documents. And that's an ongoing effort. We'll continue to do that. We review these processes every year. And, it's, it's something that really doesn't stop. Uh, we've had coordination with the reserve sharing groups. So we have a reserve sharing groups team that's going on. Uh, we met, in fact, just this morning, we were talking and we're working through the different aspects of coordinating uh, reserve sharing groups. We developed a, a procedure here at the California ISO for monitoring frequency and BA performance. We did that in concert with the reserve sharing groups and many of the, the stakeholders here as well. So that, that went really well. Um, and we've also developed situational awareness displays for all those things to go along with them. And we're getting the data to do it properly. So you know there's a little bit of shuffling in the membership of these reserve sharing groups right. that it's anticipated. Are they keeping you well-versed on what's going on with that? They are. They are. In fact, uh, just yesterday we received a table from the Northwest Power Pool of all the BAs, BAs and which uh, zones they're in and which members report to them. So. Very well. We have a, a, a RC RC coordination effort that's working through that as well. So, so coordination with uh, Jason RCs again. Uh, we're coordinating with Peak. We're coordinating with Southwest Power Pool, Alberta, British Columbia, and Grid Force. We have the agreement for with uh, Peak. We'll be getting the agreements with the other ones uh, in this next uh, before November first this year. Uh, we formed a joint coordination group, so we're looking at a lot of activities with that with those groups. We formed a team. Uh, again, all the uh, all the RCs participating in addition to the wheel and the RC transition group. Uh, Bank has been part of it. BPA, SRP, Tri-State, Shalon, and Shalon as well. They've been participating in that coordination effort. We're focusing on uh, reliability for the Western interconnection with multiple RCs. So we're really talking a lot about how the RCs are going to coordinate with each other as we work through the different operational aspects of the day. This includes all the way from starting with complex calls in the morning to discuss our OPA, to discuss the load forage cast, discuss any issues that may be uh, uh, present on the system for any given day. So Tim, to Jim Shetler's earlier question, how much outreach has GridForce done with the California ISO or RC West, I should say? So we have talked to him on the phone uh, briefly and, and outlined where we've been. We've tried to get a little bit of update where they're at. You know, they're very early in this process. Uh, they are invited to all the coordination meetings. Uh, they've attended some of them, uh, uh, but I think they they should be recognizing the scope of work they have in front of them. So we're trying to we're trying to steer them and and bring them into the conversation to make sure that they understand what what's going on, so they have every opportunity to do that. Yeah. Tim, can I just add, um, we also have at the RC to RC, our the joint RC coordination group, WEC has been also participating as well as NERC, just to add that. Yes, thank you. That's correct. Uh, we've worked on our West-wide tools, methodology, processes, and data sharing with that, and we've also uh, worked on SEAMS coordination. So a lot of you may know there was a, a, a SEAMS summit here in Salt Lake. This past week, one number of folks were here, and we're working on that as well. Uh, so that RC coordination effort, there's a lot of teams that go along with that. Uh, we have an ICP a transition team for the data. We have an ECC WIT tool. Uh, DD's been leading that. It's a shared tool activity coordination. A lot of discussion around the administration and governance of that. Uh, we have a messaging tool, so we developed the messaging tool. We've worked through the broadcast of the multiple RCs, that type of issue. 
uh, network modeling. Again, DD's been working on that. Uh, operations planning, SPP has held up or, or, or led that one. Uh, shadow operations, so I've been leading that team through the different shadow operations, as we call it. Uh, it's really a team that's trans taking us through the transition processes all the way through to uh, December 3rd, and actually we're looking at longer-term uh, coordination as well within that group. That's moving along pretty well. We meet every couple of weeks uh, to talk about issues. Yeah, I have a question on that. This is uh, Matt Smeltzer with IID. So, so originally my understanding was after the shadow operations in July, uh, we'll report everything, obviously, to RC West, ISO, and uh, Peak RC. And my understanding was it was until Peak uh, was shutting down December 31st. So it sounds like the RC to RC coordination that date has moved to, uh, I heard December 4th, 3rd, 4th. Is that the latest news on that? Uh, well, as IAD, uh, July 1st, you'll be reporting to RC West as the RC of your record. Right, uh, but we still have to uh, coordinate with Peak. Is that correct? The, that was yeah, my understanding. We still have to give them all the data. Um, everything's modified, but we still have to also report to them. Yeah, just during shadow ops is when the, the multiple paths of data has to occur. Okay, so as of July, July 1st, we're done with peak? My understanding was that was going through December. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, Didi's going to address your question here. Okay, thank you. Well, we're getting the um, the mic to Dee, Dee, but what's going to happen in December? In December is when SPP transitions to their uh, RC services. So Peak will be around until December because SPP ha would not have become RC of record till December third. But for your purposes, your RC of record would be July first with the ISO. Yeah, I think. Let me let me see if I can get the clarifications with with regards to what's happening here. Um, as part of that IRO 10 RC to RC data exchange, and there's a, there's a discussion about the IRO 10 data. Um, for the July 1 customers, people who are actually coming into California this is July 1, um, the RC West would be the official RCs. What Matt is talking about is that there are data that needs to be submitted to RC West, which is us, uh, into California ISO, uh, data that needs to be submitted to the RC West, such as load forecast, generation forecast, those are the two data that know, and outage data, for example. So the request from Peak, there have been a request from Peak that because of the number of employee, the number of people that is in there, it would make it very hard for them to make the changes to take the generation forecast data, specifically generation forecast data, to uh, to get the, to absorb the generation forecast data from um, RC West instead of from the each individual BA. So the request that Peak has um, put to all the customers that is coming to California ISOs on July 1 is to continue to send the generation forecast data both to RC West, to California ISO, as well as to peak until peak wind down on December 3rd. So what Matt was talking about is specific to, specific to generation forecast data that had been announced from peak to continue to supply that data to peak until, uh, until peak winds down because they don't have um, uh, support, they don't have people really to, to make the change with regards to generation forecast data. Now for the load forecast data and other data, outage data and whatnot, we would, we would, we would, we, RC West would, would, would be submitting it to peak and exchange that data to peak on behalf of the, of the customer. Similar ask, similar ask has been asked of us for the November 1 transition because uh, peak basically says by November 1, uh, most likely there is even less people in their, in their shop. So they would ask all our customers that are uh, transitioning to RC West on November 1 would continue to send double data, both for um, to data to send to the RC West, first, as well as data that is sent to peak, uh, really to support, and, and all this is in support for peak ability to do a day-half study, 
because as an RC, PIC will continue to have that obligation to do day head analysis through December 3rd. And for them to be able to continue to do that until December 3rd, they need to be able to get the data. And they, don't, they just don't have the resources to be able to move that data integration from, um, from, Cali, from RC West. Um, so they, they ask all the RC's member to continue to send that specific DA generation forecast data to peak. So hopefully that explains. Um, we are working through our um, we are working through our IRO10 uh, working group uh, team that Tricia is uh, is leading to communicate this uh, request this ask from Peak to everybody uh, to all the BAs uh, in that. So hopefully that explains uh, the the nuance of the the double data that needs to be sent beyond shadow operation. So Go ahead, Matt. Oh, that was a, yeah, that was a, that was my question on the on the double submission. So it sounds like it's not going to go through the end of the year. It's early December now. It, that's correct. Only for the generation forecast. But we would we would uh, we would submit the load forecast and the outage on behalf of yourself to Peak. So only for that generation forecast data. Okay, simple. Hold on to that microphone, Didi. Yeah, this is Steve Cobb. So, Didi, the old adage uh, from an operations perspective, garbage in, garbage out. So one of the things that that uh, Peak has done is, in the past, has, has set up these metrics for accuracy of load forecast submitted, that type of stuff. Are you guys looking for similar things like that from the members? I, I would like you all to actually tell me to do that. Uh, I mean, this is great because Nancy and I are actually looking at the reliability metrics for, for the load forecast. And I think I feel that the, the accuracy of load forecast and generation forecast and whatnot have been very useful. Um, maybe in the past, maybe in the past, the method of communication could be better uh, instead of sending stuff to our CEO we don't tell, without telling us, right? Um, but I, I, think the, I think the metrics is a good metrics, and I would look to you all to figure out how to communicate, how to share that metrics. Okay, thank you. Uh, we also have a team working on the uh, synchrophasers and the shared tools governance, and Nancy's been heading that. Um, so you can probably see what I'm doing. We've talked about what we did internally. We talked about what we did with our coordination with our state groups. Stakeholder groups, and then we talked about the RCs, and also I'd like to, you know, just talk about what we're doing in the industry. So we're out actively in NERC. Uh, we're on a NERC operating subcommittee. I, I sit on that the reliability subcommittee. We submitted a reliability plan uh, to that. It was endorsed uh, here in February. Uh, I've asked the group to, as our RC group, stakeholder group, or RC group as a whole, to start looking at the metrics of the all the different RCs. Maybe we can get some consistency along the type of metrics that the different RCs do throughout the both interconnections. So we're going to start looking at that. Uh, we have we're uh, involved in the standard drafting team. DD sits on the IRO2 team, and of course we participate in the WEC RC forums and summits as well. Uh, we have a on, uh, customer onboarding uh, process, in which uh, it started in May 2018. We have 140 um, onboarding webinars held to date. Uh, 28 documents are posted for customers, including the onboarding plan, the full network model overview, the architecture overview, system integration and data validation overviews, uh, communication plan, and an onboarding criteria and checklist. So very active in that area right now. Joanne Allai is, 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 is working with that group for us. And this is sort of looking at our timeline. You can see by the red uh, star where we're at right now, we're in integration testing. Uh, we'll be proceeding to data validation already. That's already starting to take place. Uh, we have a day in the life scheduled for just before shadow operations, where we look at the whole process from end to end. And then we'll enter shadow operations uh, for California ISO May 1st. And we have a, a similar process defined below uh, for the expanded footprint. 
That's Christy. Tim, can you tell me what you meant <clears throat> when you said look at some of the entire process from end to end? What process are you talking about? So today? we're looking at so a lot of integration testing has, has been somebody at the APS, for example, so many allergies and see that gets there, but it really isn't a process where it goes from uh, the staff all the way to the staff here at California Eye. So, so we make sure that the, the process is in place and the people know how to operate it. Versus it's like an, if you're familiar with relay testing, we do an end-to-end -end testing where we make sure it's from, from switch A to switch B, it it's works. All the, all the links together work together and the path is there. So, Tim, this is Steve Kopp again. It may go back to the question I just asked Didi, but you guys, the, the California ISO as a whole has a, a track record of its GOPs providing outage information, that type of stuff. Are, are you guys very successful at, that, at providing that information and having a current model nowadays? Yes, we are. Yeah, we've well practiced. We've you know worked with the IM entities and all the allergy coordination process that goes along with that. As a BATOP, we've studied our impact to allergies uh, in a very wide uh, view to begin with already. So we're pretty pretty practiced at it. I would like to call it. Uh, July first, uh, RC customers and uh, EMS network model updates are completed. Um, the network model currently represents the entire WEC footprint. Uh, we'll make incremental changes, incremental changes to the model we have in place for all customers if needed. And for each customer, we've provided our network model representation. Uh, the RC customer reviews and returns the, the, the updates if they're needed. Uh, and the FM model team has a model aligning with one of the existing quarterly updates we have uh, in, in November of 2018. And we have one coming up in uh, uh, we just did one in February, and we have one coming up in May. I, I have a question. Ali, are you with San Diego? July 1st, in addition to the ISO members, uh, which utilities are included in that footprint? So we have uh, July 1st is Sanase, um, MID, TID, you know, Bank, Hatechi. Uh, SMUD, um, LA. ID. All, it's basically, it's everybody within the California boundary plus Sanase, IID. So that's, that's what July 1st is. And then, of course, beyond that, we'll go beyond. And the May, I just want to point out that the May, um, you know, is, the, is, a, is a large footprint because it'll be the footprint beyond California boundary as well. Uh, applications that are available to customers starting in February 2019. So here's our whole list. Sorry, of can, can I? Sorry, can, can I ask you a question on that last slide? Sure. Um, so you have on your last bullets there uh, the quarterly model updates. I thought at one point you were talking about moving to a monthly model update timeline. Um, we are. We're going to move to a monthly model update. I just got an update on that today. Um, it looks like it's going to go probably the August September time frame when it actually starts to move to monthly. Um, but this May quarterly one is to get the uh, details of the rest of the model for the, the footprint. And then once we once we have all those details in, we start we'll start moving towards that monthly uh, process before we get to the November timeline time frame. And this is a list of applications that are available to our customers uh, starting in February this past month. CMRI, ELFS, which is our uh, uh, load forecast scheduling, uh, the BSAP for submitting uh, uh, RC uh, uh, forecasts and commitments, uh, and then BSAP for the EIMM as well. ED, GMS, the good messaging tool, uh, RC portal for sharing of information, the DARA report, the daily uh, re reliability analysis, uh, HANA base, and also uh, web OMS. So quite a bit of work there. Um, Shazad Patif, MD Energy. So I have an earlier question on the OMS. Is there two instances of web OMS, one used by EIM and one used by RC? Because it's the same web OMS that, that the outages are submitted on for EIM. It's just, just one instance of OMS. So, it will be the same outage, if a generation outage or transmission outage that is submitted in the web OMS, that will be whatever entity in RC needs it. 
Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. So with that, uh, we have Gina Wanzer. She's going to give an update uh, on our HANA products. Hi, I'm Gina Wanzer. Um, I'm going to be talking about Hosted Advanced Network Application, or HANA. Um, I'm currently a client rep here, moved from operations, and I'll be working on some of the RC project stuff. So with that, um, so with HANA, there's three levels of service. Um, and actually, just a little bit of background you probably know, but HANA is uh, kind of our version of hosted advanced applications that most folks, I think, use with PeakRC. Um, so the three levels of service are going to be base, visualization, and study. Um, the base is basically monitoring our TCA. Currently with Peak, you get that as well with the HAA. Um, it just creates a broader situational awareness, and they'll have a view of the real-time monitor, the real-time contingency analysis that we'd be viewing on our side here. Um, and BASE is what's going to be available as of July 1st um, for, as far as production goes as part of the RC contract. That's for anybody who has access to RC services will have access to HANA BASE. It's included in that. Um, currently, though, most if you're part of RC integration testing or you've already had some um, personnel who have gained access to the map stage environment for our HANA base, that is available for them to go in and look at now. So if they have access, they can go in and start looking at that, um, at that base model. The study and visualization are coming later. Um, those are add-on services, so these are for an added cost. There are 20 customers already signed up for HANA services, either some form of visualization or study or both. Um, and then entities who already have their own RTCA or study tools, they may not need these add-on services, but for the folks who currently use the um, HAA from PEAK, they may be utilizing these services. So that probably includes some of your organizations. Um, and then this HANA tool is going to be using the KAIS RC West network model that we were just talking about uh, the updates for. And then the readiness should actually say November 2019, so apologize for that. Um, but the HANA study visualization will be ready in preparation for uh, during the shadow operations as well as uh, go live for November 1st. So, and then just to kind of talk about some of the training that we have planned. Um, actually, we already did a starting webinar two weeks ago, so some of your folks may have been on that. We went over some of the basic features of HANA, um, and we did a demo on the HANA base UI, took a quick look at that. Um, and this material is available on the RC collaboration site. So for folks who are interested in taking a look at some of those features, they can take a look at that material on the collaboration site. Um, future web webinars, we have one tentatively scheduled for April 2019, uh, but we may push that out depending on the topics that we want to cover. Um, and then we'll be giving updates on the track three onboarding webinars to stay updated on when the next webinars will be, when the CBT is available, um, and any updates relating to HANA we'll be covering in those options. Um, HANA CBT or computer-based training is coming available. We're targeting May 2019, so we're kicking that off now. And then the HANA classroom training is targeted for August 2019. There's some days scheduled in there. More details to come on that. But just to give you a heads up, that's more of a train the trainer format. So you guys would maybe send, you know, a trainer and a super user of some sort, and we would train them, and you guys could take the, the materials back and train your on-site folks. So if it's your dispatchers or your engineers that want to take a look at that, they could um, take those materials back and train their own folks. With that, that's all I have. Do you have any questions? Steve, I've got a couple of questions for you. So first, 
Um, is the service going to be pretty much limited to real-time contingency analysis based on power flow? Are you going to do voltage stability? I know transient stability may be way out there, but... For HANA base? Yeah. For HANA base, I believe it is just the thermal and the voltage violations, but I would have to double check on the stability. Uh, I'm pretty sure you get a um, result regarding if there's a non-converged case for one. Okay. Which would kind of lead to that. For those entities that may be on the bubble as far as whether they find value in this or not, um, would the ISO consider or RC West consider allowing some of those folks to come into that training to get kind of a better handle on exactly what the service is? I believe that's an option, um, and we could talk offline about that, okay. um, but I think that would be okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, so in your discussions with the customers to date, uh, do you have a sense that they feel that what they're, what you're providing is equivalent to or matching what they've seen with the peak tool, or do you have any sense for that? Um, we've done some looks at the comparisons as far as what people are seeing. It is a change. You know, our presentation is a little bit different than how Peaks uh, shows theirs. Uh, there are some added uh ease factors, I will say, with our HANA in the sense of the filtering and popping out of windows and what's available. So uh, we've gotten very light feedback because they just got access to HANA base recently. But um, as far as our own internal groups looking at it, we've done a little bit of a gap analysis. Mm -hmm. Sure. So what would be the forum to find out then what is what would be the difference on Jim's question, what what would be the basic difference between what we're seeing with Peak's um, HAA tool and the base HANA tool? What, um, where would we get that information? So I would take a look at the webinar we did a couple weeks ago just to see what the features are. It doesn't quite directly spell here's what we have and here's what they have, and we could probably put something like that together for you guys. That'd be helpful. Yeah, we could do that, um, and because we have done that ourselves, so we can put that material together. But I would take a look at that webinar and see here's what the features are, here's what's available. Um, you know, your users, like you know, your dispatchers who are already currently in those tools, will probably identify pretty quickly what what the differences are. I think. Well, it's not just dis the dispatchers; yeah. it's also OEs doing online. Yeah, oh, and OEs as well. Yeah, okay. but I, want, I mean, yeah. Okay, so when can we expect something like that to give us that comparison? Um, I'm committing myself to something. <laughs> no, um, I could probably work on something in the next week or so, I think. Great, thank you. Would you like to report back at the next meeting of the Oversight Committee? How's that? Is it next that, month? It's next month. Yeah, that would be good. We could give an update there. There you go. Or, I mean, it's probably better if we provide the document and then you guys could go and look. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well, Gina, this is Phil. You're also planning on continuing with the work group uh, calls as well, right, or the user, mm -hmm. user group calls. Do you have one of those scheduled yet? Because there's, there's another opportunity for them to be able to get their key folks on that call and engage with you directly, right? Yeah, exactly, and I think that's what our tentatively scheduled April one is. We just want to make sure we have a good formulated message of, you know, like these things where we specifically talk about the differences and go into some of the features. Last time we kind of did a brush over of here's what you're going to see, and then soon we're going to be jumping into here's some specific features. So that would be a great avenue for that. And then one more question. Go ahead. In your, your presentation, did the, uh, the tool would be available in November? The full-on production study and visualization will be fully available for the November cutover. November 1? Should be. Should be, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Supposed to provide you uh, a 90-day um, heads up when, when we would want that. That and is correct. Nice to have it a, a, a little early so that our, we can get trained up on that and, and we'd be working with the HAA tool in conjunction with the, with the HANA tool as well. So there will be testing before November 1st that it will, it'll be available in the testing stages. So, you know, as right now we're going through RC integration testing and then data validation, that will be similar in May, I mean, in May, sorry, in November or for October timeframe when we start cutting over in September for shadow operations. 
somewhere in the end of September, October, I think is the target to make sure we can get into that study and aligned process. And, and Gina, again, this is Phil. We, one of the points I think you made earlier was there is a, a, a CBT we're planning to put out as well, right? Mm -hmm. And when was that? Wasn't that May, I think? That is targeted yeah. for May. And so what we're trying to do is stages to get you the information that you need, right, in the sense of getting that CBT out is one way. I think, Steve, your point was another one, and Gina confirmed, you know, in terms of maybe getting somebody into the training that we're going to be conducting. If you bring somebody in that training, if you think about that timeline, that's a good 90 days before, you know, but certainly May gives you an opportunity to, to do that as well. And that's why I was highlighting the fact that we still want to have the user group meetings and calls to find out, well, what, what, what's the best way to get you the information you need? So we've got a number of different layers. I think we just need to figure out what's the most effective way to do that. And I should mention as well, in addition to the CBTs, there will be like added how-to videos. So there will be steps of walking through doing certain things. Like, so for example, if you sign up for Hannah's study, it might be how to retrieve your case and run that study. Right, there will be um, how-to videos coming with that CBT model. I just wanted to avoid my ops guys and um, having to be part of like a beta testing in lieu of actually getting to a, the, 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 the real tool to be able to utilize it. Okay, point, point taken and we'll, we'll, take, we'll take this back and discuss it with the HANA team and see. Any other questions? Yeah, just, just one comment, and I know Shetler's heard this before, but um, really the ISO is, operate, is offering these services as additional services over and above their responsibilities as a reliability coordinator. So I think it's a great thing that they're doing it for those TOPs that would rather have purchase that service than developing their own set of advanced application tools. But this is really a contractual arrangement between the California ISO and those users of those services. And it, it's really still the, on the TOP to do those real-time contingency analysis, so analyses. So thanks. Yeah. Over the phone. Um, you know, we heard you, 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 people need to make a decision. You have to have enough information in advance based off our timeline that we told you when you had to make that decision to be able to make that decision, and we'll, we'll take that back. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with that, we're moving to RC certification with Tricia Johnston. So Trisha has, this is Trisha Johnstone, she's really been kind of our glue of this whole process, pulling it all together from all different directions and sides, and she's, she is now furiously <laughs> working uh, towards the certification. So if this all leads to certification, everything that we've done today and showing you what we've done is leading to this effort. So Trisha's going to walk through where we are right now. Yes, so in, in the home stretch. <laughs> um, okay, so, so just a really brief overview of, of what the certification process entails, and if I go sideways at all, um, Steve Ashbaker can course correct me. Um, but uh, so the certification process is actually something that NERC has responsibility for. So NERC has defined the process. They've got guidance documents on their site, and, and the idea is that they um, – strive for effective and consistent implementation throughout all of the regional and so they're they're involved in the process um, you know as, as Tim had mentioned kind of through the RCRC coordination but they're also members of the certification team um, and, and things like that WEC is our regional entity um, they actually have responsibility for the execution of the process so uh, the certification team lead is from WEC and um, they are organizing the meetings with the certification team members. Uh, they organize the um, kind of requests and documentation going back and forth uh, between us and the certification team. They're organizing additional questions actually um, to provide to us prior to the site visit. Um, and overall then, uh, when the certification team gets done with the process of reviewing the evidence, 
um, you know, doing the on-site visit with the interviews and, and things like that, WEC will be pulling together the report um, and facilitating the process with, with us to um, review and provide feedback on the report. Ultimately, they'll come out with um, a recommendation or an approval um, for the certification. They make that recommendation back to NERC, and then NERC ultimately um, comes forth with the approval. Um, the certification team, is, I'll, I'll talk about the members of the certification team. Um, it, it's a cross-functional team, uh, many different types of entities that are involved in reviewing the evidence that you know, we've already submitted. So I think Tim had mentioned, you know, we, we had a, a hefty kind of pre-certification questionnaire. We've already submitted an evidence package, and um, they're doing follow-up questions. They'll be out here for the site visit, and, um, and then they'll be working on a report. So in, in the NERC Rules of Procedure, it actually defines um, what a certification team for an RC type certification uh, needs to consist of. And at a minimum, it needs to include an existing reliability coordinator, uh, a BA and a TOP in the proposed RC area, the regional entity, and NERC. And it's up to um, the certification team and the regional entity in particular to determine, you know, do they have the appropriate representation on the team. And so in this case, we actually have, um, you know, much broader than, than the recommendation, but that's, that's okay. And, and I think what I've um, discussed with WEC is, is that it, they're going to try to use the same certification team for all the certifications and the reviews that they're going to be conducting this year. So that way you'll have a consistent group um, reviewing with each of the RCs um, throughout you know, the process and through the end of the year. So um, I, I put the numbers on there. I, I don't know if I'm allowed to reveal exactly who's on the team in terms of the makeup the certification team, but we do have uh, four um, people representing reliability coordinators. We've got five people representing BAs and TOPs, um, both in the July RC area as well as the future RC area. And we have 14 people from WEC, but two of those are off planning, 12 or SIP, and then we'll have two people from NERC. Um, additional members have been added who are actually not in our proposed RC area or don't meet the criteria above. They're actually in um, SPP's future footprint. Um, and then uh, additional entities, such as government representatives uh, and so on, they can be observers in the certification process. Um, so we're expecting seven additional observers on site from uh, the California Energy Commission, the Western Interconnection Energy Board, FERC, uh, National Resources Defense Council and WEC. Okay, so oh. Trisha, I count 32 people, and I guess the uh, the magic question is, how's Nancy going to manage all these folks? Yeah. So. so we've got a big room booked over here, and we're going to lock them up. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually the uh, the SIP folks they were actually just here in December because we we just had our our three year audit, and so they're doing their interviews from remote. Um, they, they've already done the visits in the server rooms, and we're not changing the configuration of, of anything. Um, so that, that portion is helpful because then there are 12 people that aren't coming on site. Um, but we, we do actually have two rooms booked, so they'll have a room where they can caucus, and then we'll have a room where we'll be presenting out standard by standard, um, and they'll be asking questions. And then um, the, the, probably the most challenging part of it is actually uh, the logistics of the control room tours because we don't want to disrupt um, normal operations. And so we're actually organizing three separate tours um, for the team to come to the control room. So three small tours of four each. Um, so as far as the observers go, are they allowed to ask questions as well, or are all the questions up to the actual certification team? So what I've been told is that the observers can ask their questions within the certification team itself, but they're not supposed to direct questions to us during those sessions, and Steve is nodding his head. So. And they'll be in the interviews as well? They will. I guess all I can say is I don't want to be an RC. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so in, in terms of timelines, so some of this are, Tim had already touched on. So we, we responded to that questionnaire in January. We sent in our package at the end of February, um, actually uploaded some additional evidence this week. 
Um, we, we also started our dry runs this week, and I think Tim had mentioned, you know, this is really kind of pulling all the parts together for the operators. So when, when you go through, um, you know, training and, and working on systems and doing user acceptance testing and things, you're, you're looking at all the little parts. And so we're, we're really going through more like tabletop simulations, but at the actual consoles and having the operators and the engineers actually pull the process together and verify the data that's coming through, that they're seeing it show up on all the right screens, um, that they've got good information, you know, for situational awareness and things like that. So it's, it's been good because we've been also shaking out, you know, little loose ends, a checklist that needs to be updated and, you know, conversations that have to be smoothed out. So it's, it's been a really good opportunity having these operators off shift um, and being able to take the time to do that. It's kind of unique relative to a lot of other things we have to do um, when you have all your staff on shift and you can't have them all in one place at once. Um, and then, uh, so the site visit is at the end of March in two weeks, less than two weeks. Um, and then after that, um, based on any uh, recommendations that, that come out, we'll have a period of time to resolve those, um, and then we're targeting to actually um, be certified by June 1st, like well ahead of the July 1st. So we'll just have to see kind of how that, that process works since this is the first time that we're running through it. Um, for the second phase, we'll, we'll actually, um, we've already pre-scheduled our next site visit for the end of July, and so we'll have a package due by the end of June. Uh, for the end of July, so that way we can start our shadow operations on September 1st. Um, so what we've done today, so this some of this overlaps a little bit, but this with what Tim had talked about, but it's specifically the deliverables that we fed into the certification. So, um, you know, a significant number of questions on the pre-certification questionnaire, um, evidence that was uploaded. It was very similar to an audit, except um, we don't really have any history because we haven't operated as an RC yet. So it's more about controls and talking about, um, you know, how we have controls around our processes, how we've trained the operators um, and, and things like that in order to give confidence that, that we're ready. Um, and then we're continuing with the delivery and training on the expanded tools and working through the dry runs. So the agenda for the site visit, they'll, they'll be here for three days. Um, and the, the scope is to really focus on the processes, the procedures, the tools, the training, and the personnel. Um, so the first day we'll have some opening presentations and then we'll go through subject matter expert interviews for all RC applicable standards. So starting with COM1 and alphabetically going down the list. And then um, by the end of day, Wednesday, we'll have completed the three control room tours. Thursday morning, we'll have um, just additional kind of wrap-up questions. And then by Thursday afternoon, the 28th, in the debrief presentation, we should have a good idea, um, you know, how things went and if there were, you know, any items that, you know, were left open. Any questions? Great, okay. thank you, Tricia. Okay. We're just caucusing on how many people are going to be going through that control room. Um, Michelle wanted me to mention we do exchange information while the, in the, during the course of the meeting. Uh, so, Phil, this goes back to the procedure for the meeting schedules. One thing she wanted to bring up was if uh, we're voting by email, it's at the time the agenda goes out, we probably should ask for email votes for those that can't be in attendance. So that, that's probably one thing we want to add to the procedure. Okay, that's the, that's a good one. We capture that. Anything else, Michelle? Did you have anything else? 
No, nothing else. So, um, as far as the operating committee goes, I don't know how many of you folks had the pleasure of attending the uh, SEAMS uh, workshop that we had earlier this week. Uh, just from my perspective, and I think Michelle feels the same way, there was a lot of work put into answering the SEAMS questions by all of the RCs that were involved. And Tim and I were talking about it earlier. I guess there were a lot longer answers to the answers that were provided within that workshop, but I think there were 54 questions total, somewhere around there, very comprehensive answers. I don't think anybody left the room thinking that there hasn't been a lot of work put into this uh, transition. So I just, I'd just i like to thank the ISO for all the work that they put into uh, answering those questions and uh, hopefully satisfying any fears that were out there that a lot of this stuff wasn't getting covered. I think we all know that we don't know what we don't know. There's things that are going to pop up. Uh, that's what operations is all about. But I think you guys did a great job in answering those questions. Great. Thank you. Um, I did want to tell everybody that we did post the longer version on our site. So if you wanted, you know, I think it was, where did we post that on the, the project steering committee, the part? collaboration site. So if you want to see the longer version of those answers, you can see them there. Um, just, a, just a comment on the scheduling of things. I think one thing that, uh, this is Shazad uh, with MD Energy. Uh, one thing that was kind of flagged for me is the, the head of the, the network applications. And the part that is flagged is um, there's still a lot of work to be done on making study modes available and then entities who rely on that for their compliance will have to train their own personnel. And all that has to happen before, um, before, you, go, before you let go of peak and, and, and latch on to the Cal ISO uh, network applications. Um, MD Energy uses its own network applications, so we don't have, I mean, we're, we are uh, planning to use that as a secondary tool because we would like to have that as a secondary tool. I think there's some entities who are using relying solely on this, and once the study mode is made available, once even we know the differences between PEAK and LISO, uh, there's still a whole training before things go live with the entities. And I think, like Steve pointed out, this is one area where compliance is still the responsibility of the entity, not the RC. So I, I, I will really appreciate a sense of urgency uh, on behalf of the, the RC uh, to, to get that done. Uh, before you before you go, Nancy, what is the official name? Is it Cal ISO? Is it RC West? Is it Cal ISO RC West? We've been seeing all of this in the documentation. Are we calling it RC West? Or are we calling it Cal ISO RC West? It's go ahead. <laughs> uh, this is Eric Schmidt. Thanks for that question, Shazad. We're we're calling ourselves RC West. We recognize that because we're in a transition. You'll notice in the discussion today, we're kind of going back and forth. We, we don't really mean to do that uh, as we move forward, but we're, we're trying to be appreciative of we kind of have one foot on the dock and one foot on the boat in terms of what we're called. So um, going forward, forward we'll, we want to be called RC West. Yeah, that would be great because as we develop our own documentation, then we will use that, that term RC West. I mean, we had enough of that when we changed from black RC to peak RC, so let's just do it one time. <laughs> and, and Eric, I guess I would applaud that clear delineation from a name perspective because I think what you're saying there is that this is a separate entity. It's associated with the RC function and the reliability uh, requirements that come along with that RC function, and it's really to a certain degree separate from the ISO and its markets and its BA. That's exactly right, Steve, and that's what motivated us to, to come to this. So we will we will work on calling ourselves RC West. We like like Eric said, we're in transition, myself included, and we're but we will start transitioning our documentation as well. We'll do it over the next, you know, several months as we naturally start looking at our documentation. Um, but we, we will do that. And Mr. Shazad, I will take back your concern and uh, try to 
uh, express that as far as the Hannah and having the time. I'm sure you're not the only one. I know everybody else, too, so thank you. This is Brian Pauling. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. In addition to um, just the applications uh, conversation that Shazad just had, um, I, there are a lot of procedures that um, entities are reworking in order to ensure that they are consistent with those of the um, RC West. And uh, several of those procedures obviously have to be approved by the RC. Um, and we need to ensure that the timing in which documents are provided to the RC, reviewed by the RC and approved by the RC, are um, provided in enough time that they are able to be trained um, by the entity staff um, prior to going effective. So uh, an example, I know we have a number of uh, procedures that are due by 5.1. But wanting to make sure that those documents uh, that are provided get reviewed, approved, and then uh, providing the entity's time to uh, train those before the 7 1 uh, effective date. Oh, good point. Good point. I, I'm writing that down and, and we'll take that. Patricia <laughs> just sees that as well. I don't know if you, um, if we have an answer. Hold on a sec. She's in the. So we have already approved Hetch Hetchy's EOP-5 plan <laughs> and, uh, and yeah. sent that back. So we've, we've actually received um, five of the EOP-5 plans for the July 1st entities so far. We have not received any of the November yet, and I, I just corresponded with Zoe at peak today, and I had told her that um, we would actually jointly review anything that was submitted to PEAK so we could give approval letters back on both. So if your entities have submitted, because there, there are EOP-5 um, changes as of April 1st, so if your entities have submitted EOP-5 plans to PEAK for review and you're a November 1st entity and you'd like us to review it sooner, you could submit those to us at any time, and especially if you don't anticipate any changes between now and then. Um, an easy way to manage the transition once between us and PEAK is to just say the RC. So we've, we've seen some cases where there's been an attempt to refer to a PEAK SOL methodology and, you know, a KISO RC methodology or, you know, back and forth. And, and, um, and so a few entities have gone back and just genericized it and just said the RC SOL methodology, and that's acceptable. So, um, and then in terms of the May 1st, if you can submit any time, you don't actually have to wait until that point. Thanks, Joanne. Okay. Agenda item, you want to ask? Okay, open the floor up. We've obviously had a couple of action items or and or agenda items uh, identified for the next meeting. Are there any other agenda items that the operating committee would like to, oversight committee would like to uh, bring up? Had a flashback there, Coco. <laughs> hey, Steve, uh, just so I'm clear, so the items I think I'm aware of now are with a HANA update. I'm assuming we'll get a certification update if based on the, what comes out of the certification review. If, what else is uh, planned for the agenda? I think we'll probably, uh, if Phil has a chance to uh, kind of finalize this procedure on the voting, We'll uh, probably discuss that, and that may be an approval item. So we'll work on that as part of the agenda as well. I'm sorry, Steve. I, I was making notes. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm just. We were just talking about the uh, as far as setting up the meetings um, when the agenda goes out. That yeah. process. We that may be one we want to review, and it's completion completed form and it may be one we just want to approve as a group oh I see okay so I was showing it kind of in a tabular form you want to see it in a different form or just be able to ask for a decision on that 
Yeah, as long as we've got it in, a, if if you want to put it in a, um, I guess I, I would say an RC West format. Yeah. Uh, that would probably be good, and then uh, we can review that and be prepared to vote on it. Okay. Gotcha. Michelle, I'm going to ask you: Are there any specific agenda items right now uh, for the oversight committee that you see coming up next month? Uh, no, I can't think of anything else. Okay. Yeah, onboarding update would be good. Tim, you're still in a dynamic situation. Do you want to provide a, you think there'll be much to provide as far as an update from operations? Okay. Consider an operations update. Anything else from the group? Okay, Christina, that's it for that like to open the floor to public comment? Yeah, so what we'll do is we'll start in the room. I'll bring the microphone back. Um, if anybody in the audience has a question or comment, um, just remind you to please introduce yourself first, and then we'll go ahead and turn it over to the phone lines. Um, if you do have a question, you're on the phone, you can press pound two to raise your hand, and we'll go in uh, order of um, those who enter the queue. So we'll start with questions in the room. No. Anybody have a question in the back there? No? Yes, Steve. Okay. Hi, yes. Uh, Steve Ashbaker from WEC. Um, I just kind of want to, while I got the mic, echo the same thing that Steve did. Uh, I thought that was a, a well-ran meeting for four hours uh, to get 53 items discussed and, and some good input came from the group on the floor. I was I was impressed from uh, being an operator. I was impressed with some of the knowledge that was uh, revealed in some of the comments and remarks that were made there, and I think it was good feedback to the sub-teams. Uh, I just, one thing that sort of gave me a little bit of heartburn is that all of the issues are still hanging on a lot of operating guides, procedures that are still out there being developed. So I think there's good progress being made. I think there's a tremendous amount of work behind the scene that's being done by you all, and so just echo that. Um, one question I have had to Eric and Brad is, what's next? And I guess, do we, are we going to have a sequel? Are we going to get back together? I assume they're going to go back and talk about some of the discussions that happened in that meeting with each of the RC leads. Uh, curious, what's next with the SEAMS discussion? So Steve, this is Steve Cobb. Um, you know, the genesis of that SEAMS discussion, I think, started in the Southwest. There was a lot of concern uh, because of how segmented we we're going to be, especially in Arizona, that uh, we got the ball rolling with that. But as, as you know from the questions, a lot of them weren't necessarily about the SEAMS. It was about general information on how the RCs are going to operate. So um, as far as part two, um, we could take it from a couple of different directions. I, I haven't, and you know, we'll go out and we'll lobby folks and kind of put a second hat on because of part of the transition group as well that Mr. Shetler chairs. We'll uh, ask those folks uh, from around the interconnection if they believe there's a need for another meeting like that. And I guess if we don't get some kind of a response back that one is necessary, I don't know that one is on the horizon. I think that a lot of questions um, should actually be coming from the customers of the individual RCs to their RC and let them answer those questions. So, I, I, you know, obviously WECC is going to do what it's going to do. I mean, you guys may feel that one of those is necessary in the future, but based on the criteria I mentioned, we don't have any plans for an additional one. Okay. No, that's fair. I, I think one of the things that may have happened was our uh, data exchange EMS work group took some due diligence on their own early on and created a list of things that were kind of merged into that seems that were really not seems issues, but but I think it's good that they got looked at and are being considered, and so uh, I think we can go with that. I think we'll continue to probably have, uh, you know, our next RC forum, we're thinking of mid-April. Uh, we're going to kind of see how things play out in that next forum as to the value of that, if we're getting good stakeholder input. and some of those areas that we talked about in the scenes meeting comes up, that's where we can talk some more about it. But uh, good work from everyone.
Any other questions in the room? So operator, do we have anybody in the queue on the phone? Yes, we do have questions in queue. Caller, your line is now open. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can. Yes, we can, thank you. Oh. <laughs> Good afternoon, it's Julia Plotnick with Natural Resources Defense Council. Wanted to say thank you very much for the presentations today and all the hard work that was put into them. There's a lot of great material. Also want to congratulate Michelle and Steve on your new chairmanships. Congratulations. And uh, look forward to working with you guys. A quick question for you on the, um, the working groups that are under the oversight committee. Are, will these working groups be open to stakeholder observation or to input from members that are not part of the RC? Um, this is Nancy Treyweek. Uh, we weren't, no, <laughs> no, we weren't planning on having those open. We're keeping those to the operations uh, staff level um, uh, as far as our members. But we will always report on what the work, working groups are on. And if anything comes up um, from a working group level that, that needs to be voted on uh, by the membership, all that will be published. So the working groups are down in the weeds. Um, but we will publish and vote on um, anything that now rises up to, you know, procedure or something that needs to be uh, at a uh, RC or oversight uh, level. Thank you, Nancy. I appreciate the updates because we like to look at the whole garden, weeds and all. So thank you. Lenny, do we have any other questions? We have another question in queue. Call your line is now open. Hi, this is Jordan White from the Public Service Commission of Utah. I just wanted to mention that I was on the call. I know that Phil had mentioned um, my new role is the re regulatory liaison earlier, so I had to take a couple calls here and there, but I've been able to listen to, to most of the first meetings, so congratulations on a well-read meeting. But anyway, I just wanted to mention that I um, have been in attendance on the phone. Thanks, thanks again. Thank you, Jordan. Any other questions, operator? There are no further questions in queue. Okay. Steve? Okay. Is uh, there anything else for the good of the order? In Phoenix. I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try to get a standby slide, so. All right. Um, is anyone opposed to adjourning this meeting? Really appreciate you all coming. ISO, great job. RC West, better job. Thanks. See you later. Lindy, you can disconnect the call now. Thank you very much for your help. And that concludes today's conference. You may now disconnect.